Okay, so we're going to touch here on the ever-important abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is something that uh, is pretty common and also can present as an emergency. So you're going to be uh, want to be really familiar with this, especially for real life, if not just for the USMLE. So we'll go over just a quick overview of uh, what an abdominal aortic aneurysm is. Um, then we'll uh, touch on the clinical picture, the guidelines and management, uh, both for the unruptured uh, AA and the uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll just show you basically what the procedure is. Uh, that's not as important, but it's good to kind of have a uh, general idea of what you're doing. And then some of the complications that can come out of uh, the, uh, the procedure. So an aneurysm is just an abnormal dilatation of an artery. It can happen in lots of different places. It can happen in your brain, it can happen in your knee, it can happen in many different places. So uh, this isn't something that's just in the uh, aorta. So uh, the abdominal aortic aneurysm is uh, an aneurysm of the abdominal aorta. Usually it's going to be uh, between where the, uh, where the renal arteries come off and uh, the uh, bifurcation to the common iliacs. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms are present in about 1-5% to of the population on autopsy. So this is something that uh, may go undiagnosed or it's just really common. Uh, most abdominal aortic aneurysms are asymptomatic, but you can detect them on physical exam if you're uh, if you if you really uh, pay good attention, do a really good exam. You can detect them uh, if you palpate the abdominal aorta, especially if they have more advanced uh, AAA. Uh, you can also diagnose these coincidentally if you get imaging for other purposes. So if you're having a CT for, let's say, uh, appendicitis, you can diagnose a patient with an abdominal aortic aneurysm that way. And actually, 38% of uh, patients are diagnosed on physical exam, and 62% are uh, diagnosed on imaging. So I should say 32% are diagnosed based on suspicion on a physical exam and 62% are diagnosed based on coincidental findings on imaging. So central to AAA management is going to be proactive repair. Actually it's recommended now that patients above 65 years of age who are male patients above 65 years of age who are smokers or have been smokers in their life should be screened for an abdominal aortic aneurysm with sonography. So the central to management is proactive repair because, as we're going to see with ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, they carry a very high mortality rate. Some of the risk factors, non-modifiable, include age, family history, connective tissue diseases like Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos, and collagen vascular diseases. Modifiable risk factors include smoking, which is highly correlated with abdominal aortic aneurysms, hypertension, and atherosclerosis. I should also include under the uh, non-modifiable risk factors, white race is uh, a big one. Uh, white men are, I think, about one and a half to two times more likely to get uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms than black men. And then male sex is another really big one. Males are four times more likely to get these than women. Ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms is what we don't want to happen. It's the reason that we try to detect abdominal aortic aneurysms and we uh, manage them. Uh, but it is the 13th leading cause of death in the United States and carries with it a 90% mortality rate. And that mortality rate is highly correlated to a delay in diagnosis. So patients who come in, and, and about half of them actually die before they, before they make it to the hospital. The patients who come in with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, we want to have a high index of suspicion uh, for those symptoms so that we can make the diagnosis. Because the longer they go undiagnosed while they're in the hospital, the more likely they are to wind up dying. And the only treatment for abdominal aortic aneurysm, ruptured or unruptured, is surgical. So this is just an example of the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Like I said, they uh, usually are infrarenal, so they happen uh, inferiorly to the uh, to where the uh, renal arteries come off. But 
they usually happen above the, the bifurcation of the common iliacs. Okay, so the unruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Most patients with this have scant clues to its presence. There aren't really any uh, symptoms or any things that, there aren't really anything that, uh, that are going to tip you off as far as the patient's history or symptoms. What you should be aware of though are the risk factors and the risk factors most importantly being a male sex, uh, age over, I would say over the age of 55, history of smoking, all of those are going to be really, really important. Uh, most patients who have abdominal aortic aneurysms also have uh, a history of atherosclerosis. The symptoms, like I said, they're minimal, especially in the early stages. Later on, though, they can have uh, that pulsatile abdominal mass when they start to get bigger. Uh, so that's something that you might see in a, a later stage of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Another thing that you could consider to be a symptom is peripheral emboli. Uh, we see this in the mesenteric vasculature as well as in the lower extremities because when the, uh, when the, the aneurysm, when you get your abdominal aortic aneurysm, the flow on the sides is slightly uh, slower. And so that allows you to, to develop, to, to develop uh, a mural thrombus, and that can then uh, embolize down into the uh, into distal circulation. So particularly, then we're thinking of mesenteric ischemia as well as uh, sudden lower extremity occlusive ischemia. Now the normal diameter of the abdominal aorta is 1.7 centimeters in men and 1.5 centimeters in women. And the definition of the abdominal aortic aneurysm is greater than three centimeters. So that's, that's a, quite a bit higher than what the uh, normal diameter is. So uh, it's going to be pretty apparent uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the imaging. Physical exam, really the only thing you might be able to appreciate is a pulsatile mass, uh, which uh, can be noted in advanced AAA. However, if you do a really good physical exam, uh, the, the skilled clinician uh, may be able to note a, a, widened, uh, a widened diameter of where you can palpate the pulse of the abdominal aorta. Uh, and so uh, basically what I want you to get from this is that there's very few uh, symptoms that come from uh, the abdominal aortic aneurysm when it's in its early stages, but what you really need to be uh, cued in on is the risk factors as well as uh, uh, the fact that AAA can uh, result in the peripheral emboli that can uh, cause that causes those uh, those vascular diseases those ischemic diseases uh, that I touched on in some of the other sections so palpating for a uh, AAA is uh, done basically as this clinician is doing here uh, it's a lot easier to do on a thin patient. So uh, really a thin patient, you can, you can feel it just by lightly touching your hand on their abdomen, but uh, you, you really need to press down hard if you've got a, a thicker patient. Uh, so like, the, uh, like the, um, the normal parameters tell you, it's usually about 1.5 to 1.7 centimeters uh, for a normal width. So if you're palpating a much wider width than that, then that's, uh, that, that should really cue you in on a possible triple A. So when do we go further than just the physical exam? When do we do imaging? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is recommended now that men who have ever smoked who are over the age of 65, they should get a one-time screening for a triple A. But when we have, uh, I mean, apart from that, when do we go physical uh, further than a physical exam? We're going to do that one if imaging suggests a AAA. So if we've done imaging for another purpose, like an X-ray or a CT or an MRI, and that shows that uh, you've got an abdominal aortic aneurysm, well, that basically diagnoses it right there. Um, 
this, but well, if it's a CT or an MRI, not if it's an X-ray, but the CT or MRI showing uh, a, uh, a, a widened abdominal aorta, that's really good diagnosis right there. Uh, on X-ray, you can see calcification of the aorta, and that's actually even present in 60% of asymptomatic patients. So that, that can clue you in too. Uh, but particularly the CT, the CT is really our, our, our main standard of diagnosis that we use. So uh, if you've got an abdominal aortic aneurysm on CT, you've really just made the diagnosis right there. So if imaging su suggests AAA, then uh, probably make your diagnosis from that. Uh, another reason that we go further than the physical exam is, of course, if the physical exam suggests a AAA. So if you feel that widened, uh, that, that widened pulse uh, down in the abdomen, especially if the patient already has risk factors for AAA, then uh, you should start with your imaging then. So if you uh, suspect AAA, then your best initial step in diagnosis is an ultrasound of the abdominal aorta. And I'm going to show you some pictures of what that looks like. The most accurate test, however, is CT with contrast or an MR angiography or just traditional aortic angiography. Uh, really, the, the best, most accurate test, the gold standard, is aortic angiography. However, that's very rarely done nowadays. Usually, the, the test you're going to go on to after you've, uh, once you've uh, seen uh, the aneurysm on ultrasound, you're going to do the CT with contrast. That's most commonly done. Uh, you also see MR angiography done, but very rarely is the aortic angiography done, even though that's our gold standard. If the patient has had what may be a complication of AAA, so if they've had peripheral emboli, uh, mesenteric ischemia, lower extremity ischemia, then you should consider possibly a, a AAA, especially if they don't have atrial fibrillation or other uh, cardiac risk factors that can uh, point us towards uh, a cause of the emboli. So here's an x-ray of a patient. Uh, this is a, a lateral x-ray of a patient with uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. And it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of uh, discreet here, but what you see is the uh, calcification around the, the, uh, around the aneurysm here. So there's actually calcification, pretty widespread calcification throughout the aorta, uh, but you can see this uh, aneurysm right here. So here's a sonography of a normal aorta. This is looking um, at it from the side, so like a transverse view. And you can't really, uh, it, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to tell based on uh, just looking at it. You have to be able to use your sonogram so you can measure it. Uh, but uh, this is, it, it shows you that it's measured at 1.78 centimeters. So this is a normal uh, abdominal aorta. It's less than three centimeters, so it's not an aneurysm. So here's another view of a, a normal aorta. So here you're looking at it straight down, and uh, here's your aorta here, your inferior vena cava, and then the vertebral body. Uh, so here's a transverse view, a lateral view of the abdominal aorta. This is clearly much bigger than three centimeters. This would be probably your normal size right here, 1.7, maybe 1.8 centimeters. Here, you're talking about five centimeters, six centimeters. And then here's another view. Again, there's really no other way to, you're not going to be given pictures of this on the test uh, because you can't tell that this is more than three centimeters um, without being told it or without being able to measure it with your, with your uh, ultrasound device. Okay, so here's a CT of a normal abdominal aorta. Your abdominal aorta is right here, listed as number five. And here's a CT of an aneurysm. So this is 4.8 centimeters. Here's another one here. And another one here. Okay. I don't expect you to get pictures on the USMLE just because you can't measure the picture um, on on your on the computer. 
Okay, so what do we do for management? The management is going to be dependent on three things. The size of the aneurysm, the growth rate of the aneurysm, and whether or not there are certain symptoms that are present. So size is the big one, one you're most likely to be asked for on the USMLE, just because it's so straightforward. So there's some disagreement as to what size we should operate, what size we shouldn't, what, what size we should just uh, observe. But what everybody agrees on is that if it's less than four centimeters, um, you don't need to operate. So you'll do, you can do elective surgical repair. The patient can be operated on later, uh, but you don't need to operate right now. And for these patients who are less than four centimeters, we will observe them and do sonography every three to 12 months. So less than four centimeters, you do not need to do surgery right away. Eventually they may need it though. If it's more than six centimeters, these patients need surgery in the near future, within the next few weeks. Uh, so greater than six centimeters, these patients need surgical repair. And not elective, they need it, need it, need it. Okay, so the growth rate, and this is why we do the serial sonography, if, it's, if, the, uh, if the aneurysm is growing more than four millimeters, which would be 0 0.4 centimeters per year, then you're going to do surgical repair. So some patients, even though they may not be in that greater than six centimeter range, if their aneurysms are growing at a, a fast rate, then we're going to want to operate on them. So growth rate more than four millimeters per year, they get surgical repair. And then the presence of symptoms, and what those symptoms are, are unexplained abdominal, back, flank pain, or tenderness of the abdominal aorta, we're going to do surgical repair on them. And patients who have a tender abdominal aortic aneurysm, those patients are at very high risk to have rupture within the next week. So these patients need to be operated on soon. So these are, uh, it's, it's these three things, size, growth rate, and presence of symptoms that you need to keep in mind in determining whether or not the patient can be observed and get elective surgical repair in the future or whether they need surgical repair now. So this kind of just goes into what I was talking about, the annual rupture risk of AAA. So uh, patients who have greater than six centimeters uh, in diameter, they should be operated on in the near future because they have a 10 to 20% risk of uh, rupture within the year. So that's a one in five risk. And remember that a ruptured aortic aneurysm is carries with it a 90% mortality rate. So if you consider that, these patients with greater than six centimeters uh, in diameter, they've got a nine to 18 percent risk of dying within the next year because of their aneurysm. So if it's greater than six centimeters, operate ASAP. So uh, as I mentioned, patients greater than six centimeters, growth rate uh, more than four millimeters per year or with symptoms uh, that suggest uh, a possible uh, impending rupture, uh, they should get, well, actually, um, these patients should get surgical repair, not elective. Cross that out. So these patients should get surgical repair. If it hasn't been done already, certainly CT or MR angiography should be done, and that's just to guide surgery. Before the surgery, patients should get a cardiovascular workup. And uh, that's just done because if the patient has severe coronary artery disease, uh, that will lower their survival from the surgery. Uh, so we should consider doing PCI or cabbage prior to repair if they do have severe coronary artery disease. So cardiovascular workup is always good to do before uh, a abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. The only, the only exception to that is if it's ruptured. Uh, the repair uh, is called an aneurysmorophy. I like to just call it a AAA repair, uh, and that's the procedure of choice that's done. It can be e either done by an open approach or endovascularly. And the contraindications to this are just a severe comorbidity precluding anesthesia. So if the patient's more likely to die on the table than they are of dying of the, uh, of the aneurysm, then that's obviously going to preclude doing surgery but there's not very many contraindications for AAA repair. 
Okay, so what about the ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm? So this is the uh, big one that, uh, it's the thing that we want to prevent. It's the thing that gets the surgeons running down to the OR immediately. It's the reason that we have vascular surgeons on call at night. So this has an extremely high mortality rate, 90%. The risk factors for a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm include, well, you have to obviously have an abdominal aortic aneurysm to begin with, but not all patients were diagnosed. Not all patients go to the uh, to to get their uh, their annual exams or to uh, to be diagnosed. Some patients don't go into the hospital until it's too late. And so the risk factors include, of course, size, expansion rate, and the presence of symptoms. It also includes comorbidities such as hypertension and COPD. So the ruptured AAA is a vascular emergency. You need to carry a high index of suspicion. And uh, this especially needs to be maintained in patients with risk factors for AAA uh, because we don't always know that the patient has AAA until it ruptures. Uh, so uh, remember your risk factors for AAA that I mentioned earlier. So like I just said, the patient may possibly have a diagnosed AAA or they may not. Most patients die before getting to the hospital. About 50 to 60% will actually never even make it to the ER uh, to, to be diagnosed with a ruptured AAA. The symptoms, what do we see for symptoms? That's going to be your classic severe pain in the abdomen, back, or flank pain. And this will, prog uh, this will progress to nausea and vomiting, ultimately then claudication, and then syncope, and then shock. So it always goes in that order. So abdominal, back, or flank pain, nausea, vomiting, claudication, syncope, shock. The patient may present in shock. Of course, what do we see with shock? We see elevated heart rate, low blood pressure, cyanosis, and altered mental status. And on physical exam, if you're, if you're palpating, uh, you can palpate a pulsatile abdominal mass in about 50% of patients. And that doesn't mean that the other 50% don't have an abdominal mass. It just means that the physician was only able to appreciate it in 50% of the patients. The best initial test is an ultrasound. And you have to do this in order to be able to diagnose a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. No surgeon is just going to cut a patient open just because they're in shock. So you need to do an ultrasound, and ultrasound will be able to diagnose a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, if the patient is not in shock, if they're stable, you can do a CT. Uh, to help the surgeon uh, with the surgery and be able to know where they're going to cut in, where, they're, uh, wh where they should look for things. Um, but if the patient is in shock, you're not going to be doing a CT. You're going to be, as soon as you diagnose them with the ultrasound, you're going to be sending them right into the OR. Treatment, of course, your ABCs, fluids, maintain your airway, etc. Um, especially if they're in shock, if they're unconscious and then uh, emergent repair of the ruptured aneurysm. And the repair is always done via an open approach for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. So here's sonography of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And you can see here that here's your uh, vertebral body and then here's your uh, abdominal aorta. And you can see the lumen coming around here, but the lumen is ruptured here. And you can see blood actually, the blood is actually spilling right out. This can be useful when you're in the uh, ER or uh, uh, by a patient's bedside. This is a Doppler sonography with color. And of course, what direction should blood be moving in in the aorta? It should be moving in the, uh, in the arterial direction. So if you've got uh, blood that's not moving in that direction, if it's moving backwards, that suggests a ruptured aneurysm, especially if you see blood moving outside of the abdominal aorta, which you see that right here. And here's a CT of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is, this is a very mild uh, rupture. So this patient probably is not in shock, probably, certainly isn't in shock. You don't have any, uh, you don't have much blood loss at all here. Uh, so this is a patient that had a CT done. And you don't need to do contrast for uh, to check for a rupture because exsanguination should be pretty apparent. Okay, and then uh, here's a rupture that uh, is quite severe. So I'm not sure why this patient's not in shock. 
uh, but this is obviously a quite a, a bit of blood here and you, you know that because you can uh, you, you see a, a disruption of the lumen okay so the triple a repair this is done uh, by prosthetic uh, graphing and uh, you, usually what you're going to do is just uh, place this well first you clamp off your aorta and clamp off your uh, your common iliac arteries distal to where you're going to place the graft and you're just going to insert this graft in around uh, in, in between the aneurysm uh, lumen and uh, this will provide you with better strength for your aorta and will hopefully preclude rupture. These are the grafts that are used. So uh, both uh, Dacron and PTFE are used. These are various grafts. We always uh, place in the graft uh, to go to the abdo uh, through the abdominal aorta, inferior to the uh, to the renal arteries, wherever the uh, where the aneurysm starts, and usually it'll go into the common femoral arteries. So that's why it's bifurcated here. Okay, so complications. So the early complications that we see after we've operated on the patient is post-operative acute renal failure. And the complications are always going to be higher for anything in patients uh, who've got emergent surgery than patients who got elective surgery. So acute renal failure, if you remember back to medicine, you should uh, be able to note acute renal failure based on your labs, your electrolytes, your creatinine, as well as the fact that the patient will probably be retaining fluid. 21% of patients in emergent uh, therapy as well as 2% uh, in elective therapy. And as you note here, these complications being more common in patients with emergent therapy, that contributes to why they have a higher mortality rate. Ischemic colitis, this is just because of uh, when, you're, uh, when you're exsanguinating, you're not going to be getting blood flow to your mesenteric arteries uh, as well as various other arteries. Uh, but with the uh, ischemic colitis, you're, with, when you're lacking blood flow to your superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, uh, you're, you're going to wind up with uh, a, a certain degree of ischemia to your colon. And where we tend to see the ischemic colitis is uh, going to be at the splenic flexure. So that's a, a really big place to look for ischemic colitis. We're going to suspect ischemic colitis in patients who have post-operative diarrhea. Why? Because the ischemic colon is not going to be able to absorb water, and it's also going to be bleeding. So post-operative diarrhea, positive for red blood cells, you should suspect ischemic colitis. You're going to work that up by uh, doing a sigmoidoscopy, uh, going up into the sigmoid colon and probably also up uh, to the splenic flexure, and then you'll treat this via resection. Acute limb ischemia, overall about 6%. The symptoms of this are going to be your pain, pallor, poikilothermia, uh, decreased pulse, etc. And uh, this is diagnosed via angiography and treated via open, repa open repair or embolectomy. This, is, this occurs because when you're putting in the graft, you can get, uh, you can get emboli from, your, uh, from any kind of plaque that's, that's around the, uh, around the, uh, the aneurysm. And then anterior spinal artery syndrome is rare, but uh, should be noted. And with anterior spinal artery syndrome, uh, what's happening here is you're just you just got a uh, you just have a decreased perfusion uh, to where your an anterior spinal artery is. And if you remember to neurology, the anterior part of the spinal cord carries the spinal thalamic and corticospinal traps, and so that function is going to be compromised and remember your spinal thalamic tract carries your pain and temperature fibers, your corticospinal tract carries your motor fibers. So those are going to be compromised below the level of the lesion. The lesion is usually anywhere between T8 to L4. Usually though around T8, T9, T10, 11, and 12. This is diagnosed via MRI and this is not really an emergency because recovery is unlikely. So there's really nothing we can do for this. And then of course death is an early complication. 50% in uh, emergent patients and elective patients 
not negligible. It's about 1 in 50. So this is a reason why we don't want to be too gung-ho about doing, uh, about doing uh, elective therapy if we don't have to. Long-term complications. So this is just simply due to the surgery. So male sexual dysfunction. And this is both due to neurologic and vascular causes. There's sympathetic nerves that travel along the abdominal aorta. And those can be damaged, which can result in ejaculatory dysfunction. You can also get erectile dysfunction due to damage uh, when you're clamping the, uh, the internal iliac artery. Or common iliac artery, rather. And then aortic graft infection, this is about 1 to 4% overall, and this is really, really long term. So this can happen any time after uh, surgery. It can be 10 years down the road. And the symptoms of aortic graft infection, like any infection, are going to include fever, uh, but also what you'd see would be abdominal pain and inflammatory masses, usually draining to the groin, where the, uh, usually where the, the graft ends. You can also get lower GI bleeding, and that's called an aortoenteric fistula. Uh, the uh, aorta is actually fistulizing because of that infection into the uh, duodenum. And so the lower GI bleeding you would see would be melana because you're getting blood into your duodenum. And so because that's upper GI, that's going to be melana. And for diagnosis, if there's GI bleeding present, which would be black tarry stools, the best initial step is going to be endoscopy, and you should be able to see that aortoenteric fistula. Um, you should be able to see blood uh, in the distal part of the duodenum. Other tests are going to include CT scan and indium tagged white blood cell scan. I can't imagine you're going to be asked for that on the test. Treatment is going to be total graft excision, removing the graft that's infected, and then uh, you'll clamp off at uh, where the graft had came off, and what you're going to do then is uh, you'll do an axillofemoral, usually axillobifemoral bypass. And so here's an axillofemoral, uh, axillobifemoral bypass, and so you're, uh, this is always going to be done uh, with a synthetic uh, graft so usually Dacron, and uh, you make your bypass from the uh, axillary artery way up here in the upper circulation all the way down to the uh, common iliac artery. And then you'll also make a, uh, a, a bypass uh, from your uh, uh, iliac to iliac. Uh, actually, it's probably, uh, I don't know. Well, the way, that, the way it makes it look, makes it look like... Uh, this is coming in at the uh, common iliac, but uh, by its name it should be the femoral artery, so I'm not sure about that. But either way, this is actual bifemoral bypass is what we do for patients who have uh, infected uh, aortic grafts. And that should be it.